Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning. Depends on uh, where you are joining us from. Uh, I am Mir Milosevic. Uh, I am the executive director of the Global Forum for Media Development. Welcome to one of the first webinars in GFMD's Capacity Building Program. Uh, our um, GFMD Capacity Building Program, just a couple of words about that, is um, a result of uh, consultations with our small and medium-sized members and uh, some of you are uh, GFMD members and we hope that those who are not will become our members uh, and uh, most of uh, you have told us that you need uh, practical skills that can help you to survive and thrive in a very competitive nonprofit environment. And based on this, uh, together with uh, Michael, we have put together a program uh, that will help local organizations get a better understanding of the basic building blocks of nonprofit management and uh, efficient fundraising. Uh, the plan is to also tap into the expertise of our large network, uh, and we will be engaging different experts who will provide general strategic advice, um, enabling you to better navigate the international donor landscape and negotiate effective partnerships. Uh, we have been working closely, as I said, with today's speaker, Michael Randall, to design this program, and we are very excited to be able to share this today with you. Michael will be speaking on the topic of how to write a successful proposal for media development projects. He's a media consultant with 20 years experience in designing, writing, and evaluating proposals. He has an exceptional track record of securing funding from all the major donors, as well as European governments and private foundations. Michael worked for BBC Media Action for 17 years, focusing on areas such as TV co-production, drama and documentaries, community radio, social media, journalism training, media regulation, media law reform, and public service broadcasting. We couldn't hope for a more qualified speaker on this topic. And uh, with that, Michael, I will uh, hand the microphone to you. Uh, if anyone has any question at any point, pre please use um, the chat window. Thank you very much indeed, Mira, and, uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I'll be speaking for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes uh, on the subject of proposal writing and proposal development. Uh, I have, my, my claim to fame is that I have written a lot of proposals. I've written more proposals than anybody else I know. Uh, and I have specialized over the last uh, 10, 15 years, particularly in developing proposals for the European Union. Uh, but also have worked uh, with American donors and uh, extensively with the British government. I think that uh, proposal writing is a much maligned art form. I think that it's uh, an activity that can be rewarding, uh, hugely involving and creative on many levels. Uh, the secret for me around proposal writing and project development itself is never to do it alone. I think it's a, it should always be a, a collective activity. Uh, it should be a process that involves partners, colleagues, beneficiaries, uh, that involves uh, everybody in the process of defining activities uh, and deciding how they're going to be managed and implemented. So I would advise any organization uh, that wants to strike out in the field of proposal development to take a team-based approach to, to, to writing proposals uh, and to ensure the full engagement of all those who will, will be most directly uh, affected by it. Um, about the seminar, um, so yes, I'm going to talk about the building blocks of a proposal. Um, I'm going to talk about those building blocks specifically in relation to media development and a look at the particular challenges that media development projects bring. Uh, it goes without saying that developing a program for training journalists, uh, developing television uh, or radio shows is very different from a project uh, that has much more concrete outputs. It's different from building bridges. It's different from training border guards. Uh, these are programs that have very specific outputs and often have what donors might consider to be more 
abstract results. So these are some of the issues that we'll be focusing on. Um, it's not possible to cover the whole field of proposal writing and development in, in, in 40 minutes, but I wanted to uh, share with you my observations um, accrued over the last uh, 20 odd years of, of, of developing proposals uh, and to uh, share those um, my ideas about how to tackle the, the, the different aspects um, of a proposal. I think this, uh, uh, this presentation is more aimed at those who have a limited experience uh, of developing proposals, but I think it's also useful even for very experienced proposal writers to have the opportunity to hear from a colleague involved in the same field uh, and to have the opportunity to gain an insight into the experience they've gained uh, and perhaps share uh, some ideas or impressions that they might have themselves. So given the, the limitations of the medium, I will try my best to make this interactive and I will try to respond to questions as and when they arise. Um, I'm going to uh, base my uh, discourse around uh, a number of PowerPoint slides and also a couple of videos. Uh, which will spare you from looking at my face for the next 40 minutes, but um, I'll try and come backwards and forwards uh, and make this as uh, rewarding a viewing experience as possible. Um, so, to bring up the PowerPoint, uh, which I think you can all now see, um, I just wanted to lay out the, the goals and outcomes of the webinar in the format that a donor would expect uh, to look at goals, results, outputs and activities, uh, which, as you know, are the bread and butter of a proposal and the fundamental building blocks of a logical framework. So the goal of this webinar is to help you improve uh, your success rate by effectively developing your skills, to improving your ability to write compelling and compliant proposals. Uh, and that we're going to achieve, or we're going to work towards that goal by uh, this webinar and the uh, materials that sit around it. This uh, slide is more generalistic. It's uh, a, a discussion of what donors want to see uh, in your proposals. I divided it in, into two parts. Uh, so what they want to see in project design and what they want to see in the application forms themselves. Uh, first and foremost, I believe that donors want to see complete adherence to a programmatic goals. They want your projects to come as close as possible to the goals that they have established through their programs. And it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but I think very often uh, agencies are tempted to cut and paste ideas to present the same proposal to multiple donors in the hope that one will fund it. And to have such faith in the genius and creativity of the project that the donor might forgive them for not matching the goals of the program 100%. I think that's completely wrong. I think that physically they will not give you money if you're not ticking those boxes. Uh, they can't give you money if you're not ticking those boxes. You need to uh, be absolutely sure that the program you're applying for uh, is um, able to support the kind of activities that you're proposing. Uh, I think it's a little bit like authors who write uh, a children's book and then try and pitch it at a publisher that only publishes adult thrillers. They're never ever going to publish your book uh, and uh, however you know great they might think it is. So read the program goals and adapt your activities accordingly. Um, Measurable outcomes. This is, I think, one of the fundamental problems inherent in media development, that a lot of the outcomes to which we aspire, a lot of the results that we uh, work towards are extremely difficult to measure, uh, either because the concepts are abstract or because we're dealing with a very, very wide 
uh, target group or a set of beneficiaries. But as far as possible, look for outcomes that can be measured and include in your proposals the mechanisms for measuring them. I think partnerships are enormously important and we'll come on to this later on. Um, but when you present your own uh, track record and that of your partners, bear in mind that donors are looking for uh, organizations they can rely on. Uh, their horror is giving large sums of money to an organization that is incapable of dispersing it and incapable of reporting against it. So they're going to be looking for reassurances that you have those systems and those resources in place. Value for money has become more and more important as time goes on. So again, something that should be woven into a bid uh, wherever possible. And value for money is not simply about ensuring your consultants stay in cheap hotels and fly economy class. It's about having the right project management structure in place, about presenting the right kind of activities that will achieve your goals uh, for the least possible uh, or for the lowest possible financial investment. Uh, we'll talk about innovation as well later on. I think there's been a lot of insistence or a lot of interest from donors recently in the innovation of projects, in, if you like, encouraging implementing agencies to come up with new and sexy ideas. Uh, I personally don't think this is the right way to go. I think that uh, innovation is good where it works uh, and where it helps you to achieve those goals. But innovation for innovation's sake is not valuable and it's particularly not valuable in an industry that continues to need basic training and basic skills. So I think innovation, if you can introduce it into your proposals and emphasize it where it exists is good, but it should never be the be all and end all of a project. In proposals, it's clear what donors are looking for. They're looking for something that is uh, clear and logically presented. They, want, they will want you to meet their guidelines, to uh, adhere to their guidelines, to uh, obey all the rules that they've set you, because again, otherwise, physically, they won't be able to um, award you a grant. And they're looking for an approach that's well thought through and that is well presented. And I think those two issues are well, are well worth bearing in mind. Uh, when you write a proposal, you need to have in the back of your mind a picture of the evaluator or the evaluating committee. You need to recognize that these are human beings who are probably processing dozens of proposals. You need to make yours stand out from the crowd. And I don't think that's always about it being the best designed uh, or the most visually attractive. It's, often, it's, it's about it being well presented, it's about the ideas being uh, logically framed. So I mentioned earlier that media development as an industry has a, a particular set of challenges uh, and uh, some of those are listed here. As I'm sure you're all aware, <clears throat> one of the difficulties we often face is a lack of real understanding of the media within donor circles. Uh, also too great a set of expectations about what can be achieved in a short time. And again, that's linked to a lack of understanding about the way the media works. Uh, most change management, uh, capacity building, takes a long time to cascade down uh, into output and production. Uh, it's not realistic to expect one training course to uh, radically improve the output uh, of a single media outlet. These things do take time and donors unfortunately want quick wins. Uh, so again, this kind of craving for innovation and for um, results to be delivered swiftly kind of stands in the way of effective project delivery and management. And I think the only way to get around that is to almost play donors at their own game to introduce an element of project design that will have uh, results in a short time frame, but to also focus on much longer term results and make the donor uh, aware of the realistic timeframes for achieving them. 
synergies and duplication is uh, areas which have very much come to the top of the donor agenda. Donors are recognizing more and more that uh, a lot of similar projects are being funded in the same uh, location, in the same country. Uh, and there's a lack of coordination, not only between implementing agencies, but also between donors. So uh, I think that more and more, this is an area that needs to be looked at in proposals. Uh, and I think it's extremely important to have information about what else is happening in the same environment when you design a project uh, and to be able to highlight any areas in which synergies with other projects and other programs can be explored. The statement in bold at the bottom there is kind of what, where I feel uh, success can be achieved in media development. I think it's all about finding a space where agendas overlap. Uh, often the donor has one set of ideas, the implementing agency has another, and for beneficiaries, both those uh, uh, agendas are very far away from their own. So projects work where you can find uh, that overlap. Um, and that overlap, uh, e examples of that overlap uh, in uh, recent experience are, say, around um, EU accession agreements. So in the Western Balkans, uh, several other countries have signed up to EU accession. Uh, part of EU accession is uh, having a, a viable public service broadcaster. So this is leverage to uh, encourage state broadcasters to embrace public service values. That's an area which donors want to fund. And obviously there are a number of, me a number of media development agencies that specialize in that field. So by bringing those agendas together, one can achieve concrete results. The other area uh, I wanted to talk about in the more general context of project design is partnerships. Uh, as I said earlier, I believe that partnerships, workable partnerships make for better projects. And for the, uh, the um, issues listed on the slide, are those which uh, legislate for effective partnerships. So it's important that the partners have complementary skills. It's important they all believe in what the project's doing and not only in that segment or component of the project which they are responsible for. I firmly believe that all partners need to contribute to the design of the entire project and again not just their component and should share the project management burden. Uh, this is all about collective and inclusive decision making and participation. Um, partners need to, be, need, need to feel that they're, they're, they're part of a whole uh, and that the experience uh, and expertise that they bring to the table is properly recognized and properly respected. And that's particularly true of local partners. Uh, local partnerships, I think, are absolutely vital in ensuring that uh, projects can hit the ground running and can enjoy credibility on a local level. So the next uh, uh, st uh, stage or the next session will be uh, uh, talking through the, the building blocks uh, of a, uh, a standard uh, funding proposal. So these uh, sections, if you like, that are listed there are specific to EU proposals, but are also reflected according to various terminology and in various shapes and forms in almost all donors' proposals. But before we do that, I just wanted to uh, show you two videos uh, which are taken from projects that I managed when I was working for the BBC. Um, and I think they illustrate a number of points that I will be touching on later on. Uh, it's not a question of it was a good one was a good project and the other was a bad project. Uh, they illustrate different extremes, if you like. They were both projects that had high risk factors, and uh, one I think 
justified expectations and one much less so. Uh, and so much of that was linked to the design of the project itself and also to the management of expectations with the donors. So without further elaboration, I'm going to uh, show the videos uh, one by one and give you a brief explanation after each uh, of what the projects were about. So this is the first one. Can you see and hear that? Радиостанция Эхо – это, несомненно, позитивное радио. И несмотря на то, что вы слушаете нас в исправительной колонии, а это особой бодрости не вселяет, но вы слушаете нас, а вот это уже точно хорошо. Хорошо, потому что радиостанция Эхо – это актуальная и свежая информация, а также несущая заряд бодрости и хорошего настроения музыка. У микрофона, надеемся, как впрочем, в ближайшие несколько лет для вас работают руководитель и редактор радиостанции Эхо Алексей Ковалев и ведущий программы Дмитрий Щербин. So, uh, this was a, a program that was uh, implemented in uh, the Russian penal system. Uh, we established um, radio stations in six penal colonies, and we trained the prisoners to uh, produce their own radio shows. Uh, and the project ran over two years, and uh, during that time we successfully established the stations and produced a very wide range of programming, which included uh, drama, music shows, talk shows, and uh, uh, informational segments. The focus of the uh, informational programming was on uh, health uh, and the legal aspects uh, relating to the penal code or changes in the penal code. So the idea was to um, improve the access to information that prisoners had uh, around issues which impacted directly on their lives. Um, the project had a clear and uh, achievable objective. It, it was about helping prisoners to make informed decisions uh, which could improve or save their lives. Uh, and because it was implemented in that environment, you effectively had a captive audience uh, and you were able to very closely monitor and record their response to the programming. So uh, it was, uh, without wishing to be flippant, it was almost an ideal scenario for, from a monitoring and evaluation point of view. Um, but more importantly, the programming itself had enormous impact on the prisoners uh, because it addressed issues that were of great concern to them. Uh, and from the, I talked earlier about uh, this uh, area where um, agendas overlap, you may ask, why did the prison authorities allow that to happen? And from their perspective, it was also hugely advantageous and beneficial because you were addressing the frustrations experienced by prisoners um, and you were giving them information that was difficult or if not impossible to disseminate in any other way. Uh, so it was a, a, an extremely successful project that was able to demonstrate very positive results over a relatively short period of time. Uh, and again, this is an area we'll look at later, but the, the, the methodology behind it was very strong um, because of the, the, the selection of activities uh, and the selection of tools were very closely linked to the environment and to the situation in which its beneficiaries found themselves. I'm now going to show you the second video, which is uh, at the opposite end of the scale, both in terms of its audience uh, and in terms of uh, its context.
Shankabut is the world's first Arabic language web series. But that's by no means its only claim to fame. Against the backdrop of a TV industry dominated by lightweight Turkish and Mexican soaps and heavy-handed Arab drama series, Shankabut has pioneered a new approach to storytelling and has set new standards for interactivity. Shankabut is edgy and upbeat, fresh and naturalistic, a story tinged with comedy and rich with witty social observation, an attempt to explore what is to be young and free in a divided and often contradictory society. Shankabut is set largely in Beirut, a city in a process of renewal and one of the most vibrant capitals in the Middle East. Citizens are keen to shrug off their troubled past and explore new horizons. In an environment where TV programs are often censored and sanitized, many young Arabs are turning away from mainstream media in favor of the internet and the freedom it offers. Internet connections in Lebanon can be agonizingly slow, but the web at least has no divisions. The user is in control and is free to make his or her own choices. So this project was aimed at uh, developing a vehicle for challenging stereotypes uh, and entrenched attitudes within uh, Lebanese, but more widely Arab society. Uh, it was a, the, 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 the vehicle for our messaging was a, a web drama. So uh, a sequential drama that was published uh, through the internet, through a dedicated site and through social media platforms. Uh, and it was hugely experimental. Uh, there hadn't been uh, a web drama published in the Arab world before. And actually the experience of web dramas that had been um, uh, published in, in Western Europe was, uh, was varied. Um, some had managed to accrue large audiences, some less so. Uh, and we have to remember, or we should have perhaps taken into account when we developed the project, that there is no culture of watching sequential drama on the internet. Uh, so this was uh, a, a new idea being pitched at an audience that was overwhelmed with choice uh, and was not accustomed to this uh, medium and this mode of engagement. Uh, the, in terms of uh, bringing, around, bringing about behavioral and attitudinal change, the project um, relied largely on uh, interaction through discussion forums. Um, and again, um, discussion forums are something that's hugely difficult to control, to moderate, and to, to push in, in, in a certain direction. So, um, I think that uh, we we had a number of assumptions. We uh, embraced a number of assumptions in our proposal, which, when put to the test, turned out not to be uh, as effective or as relevant as we had hoped. The project was successful. It was very successful. It won an Emmy. It, uh, I think, very much pushed back the boundaries in terms of creativity. It was extremely well produced by a very talented team. It didn't generate anything like the uh, engagement and interactivity we had hoped for. And as I say, I think that that was largely down to um, a lack of understanding of what, of how the medium worked and the mentality of social media users. Um, so it was questionable in that particular instance whether the internet was the right tool uh, and whether the ambition to drive discussion was something that could achieve the goals that we had set ourselves. I see that uh, uh, Masood has asked a question of perhaps examples from Pakistan. I don't have any examples from Pakistan, but uh, I would be very interested in, uh, in seeing examples of other people's work. I think one, of, one thing I'm keen to do in the course of my professional activities is to pull together examples of successful programming from all over the world uh, and share those with uh, professionals involved in this industry because I think we have so much to learn from each other. 
and I shudder from the prospect of cut and paste proposals, you know, that or ideas that are taken from one country and uh, kind of repackaged for another. But uh, I think that there are absolutes within this industry, and there are uh, experiences that we will all we can all learn from each other. Okay, um, so to go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Um, as I said, we're going to now just go through the building blocks of, uh, um, of a standard proposal. Um, and the first area I wanted to touch on is uh, the, the logical flow for project design. I'm sure this is a concept you're all familiar with. Um, log frames or theories of change, various ways of presenting the uh, flow of, uh, of uh, the design from inputs through to activities, through to results uh, and, um, and uh, impact. Uh, the donors currently tend to uh, embrace one approach or the other. So either they include log frames uh, in their application forms or they a lean towards um, a, a theory of change as a way of demonstrating project impact. Uh, personally, I have come to prefer the, the theory of change as an approach because I think it pr provides a, a, a clear and visually attractive or more attractive logical progression that makes it much easier to sell your ideas or to share your ideas with uh, other interlocutors. Um, you can see uh, in that particular uh, example on the screen the logical flow of the project moving from left to right through the activities, through the outputs, the outcomes and the impact. Uh, and it is an interesting, it's a more interesting, I would say, a more engaging process sitting around a table and filling in the different stages of a theory of change than it is filling in a log frame. Um, I see the, the process, if you like, or the um, overarching logic of a proposal a bit like throwing a stone in a pond. The, the stone is the activities and the ripples it creates are first the results uh, and then the objectives. Uh, if you like, the further out the ripples go, the, the harder they are to see and perhaps the harder they are to measure. Activities lead to results, typically or outcomes, however you want to call them. Uh, but results work towards objectives. And I think this is the, the key distinction, that uh, an object, the objectives you set a project, they typically depend on other factors that are outside the control of the project, whilst results are something you should be able to directly control. Um, when um, you devise a log frame or, or a theory of change, uh, there are different uh, opinions about how that is best achieved, whether you should start with the objectives and work your way down to, to the activities or vice versa. I think the reality is that most uh, agencies start with the activities. They have a set of activities that they believe would work in this context and they then work up to, to how those activities can deliver uh, uh, objectives. Either approach uh, is, it works, uh, especially if you are very familiar with the situation on the ground and you know what is going to have impact and what's not, uh, or what's going to be feasible and what's not. So uh, don't feel you're getting it wrong if you're, if you're starting with your activities and working up to, to your objectives. Um, the, the, big, the biggest mistake that I see in proposals uh, is objectives that are activities, uh, results that are objectives, basically getting things back to front. Uh, and I think there are uh, very simple ways of, of focusing one's thought uh, around the logical flow. So, for example, if your project is to wash your car, the objective of washing your car is not to have a clean car. That's actually the result. The objective might be to create a good impression on your neighbors. The objective therefore requires other factors to come into play for it to be achieved. And it's a much longer term 
process. So to impress your neighbors is not just it's about having a clean car, it's about being well dressed and well spoken. You know, these are other things that, uh, that, that, that uh, play a role. So I think you always need to think about objectives being the ultimate extension of what you'll do that will not necessarily be achieved within the uh, project life cycle. Um, it's the same if one were to take uh, the example of, uh, of training journalists. Uh, it's not about uh, making, uh, making, better journal making better media professionals, making a more professional industry. Uh, that's not going far enough. Uh, it's, you should be thinking out to the, uh, the beneficiaries. You should be thinking about uh, training journalists being a means of giving audiences access to higher quality and better information. So always think one step ahead uh, when you're creating a log frame uh, and always think about uh, the, the, the furthest ripple, if you like, in the process uh, that you have triggered or that you've engendered. Um, I just, go, I, I think there was a question that came up. I just wanted to have a look. Um, so uh, how to measure qualitative output uh, of any project and how to differentiate between output uh, and outcome. Again, output and outcome are terms that tend to be abused by donors. Some, some donors will describe uh, an outcome as a result, but will mean a result when they, when they talk about an outcome. So that is um, what we were talking about earlier, uh, the clean car or the journalists who have uh, acquired new skills. Uh, some donors will see an output as a deliverable, so something physical. So in the case of this webinar, the output is actually the PowerPoint presentation itself or the videos that I showed you, whilst others will see outputs to be results. <laughs> so it is hugely confusing. Uh, and it would be great if one of these days GFMD could introduce consistency within the industry because it becomes difficult to uh, present projects to multiple donors when uh, you're having to change the terminology each time. Um, so the way I prefer to do it, and certainly the way that uh, is embraced by the theory of change, is to consider uh, an outcome to be a result and an output to be something physical you produce as a result uh, of your activities. Uh, in terms of qualitative output, um, again, it is uh, a question of the, the activities themselves, whether you're talking about uh, programming or whether you're talk about, talking about training programs. But I think that it's important for quality to be assessed through engagement with audience as far as possible uh, and also through engagement with uh, target groups that have been directly involved in project activities. And it's not about uh, questionnaires, ultimately. It's not about handing out a set of questionnaires at the end of a training course, getting people to fill it in and saying, now we have demonstrated the value of what we're doing. Because in fact, the value of what you're doing uh, is not, does not stop uh, at the end of the training course. It goes way beyond that. What you want to test qualitatively is the extent to which those skills are being applied in the workplace. And that's a much diff more difficult thing to do because there are so many barriers and obstacles to implementation. But um, follow-up interviews with beneficiaries or evaluation of programming produced by uh, trained journalists post-training, you know, these are certainly ways of doing it uh, and uh, certainly uh, convincing arguments uh, from the donor's point of view. The problem is the, the resource uh, uh, and the, um, the management overhead of um, delivering on that. Okay, um, so the rationale, all proposals will include a rationale section. They might call it something different, maybe context or background, but it needs to be there. Uh, I think this is an area where many proposals go wrong. 
I think there's a temptation in a rationale section for proposal writers to share everything they know about the subject, to uh, show off about how much they know, uh, to try and cover all of the bases. I think a rationale section should be directly linked to uh, the, the, the logic of the project, that you should be setting out the problems that need to be addressed uh, and assessing their scale uh, or the extent to which they are widespread within the target sector uh, and then leading on to an argument in future sections about how those particular problems will be addressed. So my advice is not to be generalists, not to overwrite them, uh, not to patronize the evaluators by uh, stating the obvious, but also don't assume ever that an evaluator is either a media expert uh, or uh, has specialist knowledge of you know, technical uh, or programmatic issues. Uh, so as I say, include only facts which are relevant to the project um, and uh, reference them where possible, uh, include um, a, a reference to what is going on in the wider sector. We discussed this earlier. So it's about uh, demonstrating an understanding of other programs or projects with which your project will need to engage and need to complement. Um, I think that often rationale sections are used to sell the project idea. I, I think you shouldn't do that here. There's plenty of other room for doing that. So stick strictly to the facts uh, and to an expose of the, uh, of the situation that exists. A question there about um, writing the title of a project about what should be in the title of a project. I mean, I, I, there are no rules for that. Uh, it uh, shouldn't be too long. Uh, increasingly projects, uh, sorry, donors, uh, want projects to have an acronym a catchy acronym they can use. So thinking up one of those is definitely a positive. Uh, I, I wouldn't put the, uh, the goal of the project in the title um, because again, that's not where it should be. But uh, I tend to uh, lean towards titles that have a kind of two or three words that uh, capture the imagination um, and then uh, five or six words that explain it. So in the instance of that pr Russian prison project, the, uh, the title of the project was Voices from the Zone, because the zone is what the Russians call the gulag or the, uh, the penal system, and obviously Voices because it was a radio project. And then there was a longer explanation that it was about training prisoners to develop um, um, programming, uh, awareness raising programming. Um, so, as I said earlier, the rationale should lead naturally to this next section, which is about listing your target groups and your end beneficiaries. Typically, in media development projects, the target groups are those with whom one um, engages directly through activities. So uh, the journalists, the editors, uh, perhaps civil society organizations, perhaps government stakeholders. Uh, and Generally speaking, target groups will be quantifiable because uh, you'll be able to calculate how many people are involved in specific activities. So the target groups will benefit from the, the core activities that usually establish a framework or a resource for the development of, uh, of programming or, uh, or, or more long-term goals. Uh, so the end beneficiaries will be those who benefit from the activities of the target groups. And again, typically it will be audiences, vulnerable groups. It may be other media professionals who benefit from greater professionalism within the sector. Uh, and these beneficiaries are, are harder to quantify, um, but uh, are obviously um, essential to the achievement uh, of your goals. The, uh, the methodology section is uh, effectively about uh, presenting your, your management approach, um, but also justifying the activities that you've selected in order to uh, achieve your goals. 
So that's why I divide my methodology into uh, in, an internal methodology that's internal, if you like, to the consortium and the donor, and external, which looks at the delivery um, and, as I say, justifies the, meth the, the methods that have been selected. I think it's very much important at the moment to uh, describe how you're going to maintain good communications, not just within your own team and your own uh, consortium, but with the donor. Uh, donors want to feel that they're going to work with a consortium that's going to share information with them regularly, that information is going to be of high quality, and that they're going to respond to the findings of, say, monitoring and evaluation exercises in order to improve the quality uh, of what uh, they're delivering. Uh, we talked already about value for money and about the synergies with other initiatives. I, I think you know, these, again, are areas that can be covered within the methodology section. In terms of uh, external methodology, uh, this is perhaps the section where one does talk about innovation, where one uh, presents an argument for having selected uh, various approaches. Um, and uh, if they are innovative, uh, then to emphasize why the innovation is going to improve the, uh, the end result. Um, in the examples I showed you, um, the, the, the choice of tools and the justification of tools was absolutely key. Uh, in the prison context, it was, um, it was uh, about um, uh, a radio platform that would give maximum exposure to all of the prisoners in the colony because the, uh, the, the, the speakers were effectively uh, placed within the, uh, within the barracks and linked to the studio through a fixed line system. So you could guarantee that all the prisoners would be able to have access to all the programs. So it was uh, an easily justifiable methodology. In the, in, in the uh, context of the web drama, much less so because again you were uh, presenting a new idea, a new approach and a different medium uh, and it was uh, harder to justify why that was the best way of presenting the messages beyond saying that if you don't try it once you'll never know <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you know, we, we, we demonstrated that web drama could be produced in a new and exciting way and could create a buzz we didn't demonstrate that it was the most effective way of uh, delivering those messages to uh, a wide audience and uh, stimulating a debate around them. Uh, there's a, a question about replication effects. So um, replication is about your activities or the, uh, the results that you're achieving being replicated beyond your immediate target group. So for example, you train 10 journalists uh, in investigative journalism, they go back to their place of employment and they share the findings or the uh, outputs of the training with their colleagues and their colleagues then replicate uh, those same approaches. So it's about um, ensuring that uh, your project investment uh, has the widest possible take up. Uh, and the widest possible resonance. Okay. So one could do a separate uh, webinar on monitoring and evaluation, and I won't go into it in enormous detail beyond saying that um, monitoring is about making sure that activities are on track, uh, that they're meeting the needs uh, of the target groups, uh, and that where necessary, um, the, the the feedback is being used to improve the quality of activities or to recalibrate them, should that be necessary, to uh, reflect new information received. So monitoring is very often uh, achieved through holding regular uh, focus groups or sharing uh, feedback forms or having uh, you know, interviews with uh, those who have taken part. Um, in the context of the of the prisons project, 
it was clear that um, monitoring and evaluation was going to be uh, an easy uh, uh, task, uh, one that you know we could manage and con con control very well. For the web drama, much less so, because although we have the benefit of um, online audience metrics, uh, so we could easily see how many people were accessing the drama, uh, how many people were leaving messages, how long they were spending on the website. Uh, we were much less able to monitor or evaluate the extent to which the drama was impacting on their attitudes or behavior. The only tool for doing that was effectively the um, discussion forums. Uh, and in order for the discussion forums to work, you needed to have uh, a resource behind them. Uh, you needed to be able to uh, enrich and provoke uh, discussion uh, so that representatives from different identity groups could be involved and therefore their reactions could be recorded uh, and assessed. Uh, unfortunately, in that project, we didn't place enough emphasis on that activity and therefore our ability to monitor and evaluate the wider resonance of the drama were extremely limited. Um, I think now that um, many donors recognize that monitoring, evaluation and media development projects is more complex than they had originally anticipated. Uh, and some donors will settle for simple reach. Uh, they'll see um, a project audience figures uh, as being enough um, of a result you know, to justify the investment, which I think is wrong, but uh, obviously for, as, a, as a monitoring and evaluation challenge is significantly easier to, uh, to overcome. Um, I think it's personally wrong for uh, organizations to, um, to create large internal teams which monitor and or which evaluate the impact of projects. I think it needs to come from the outside. Uh, and although um, there are plenty of uh, agencies out there who will carry out surveys, uh, who will organize focus groups, I think one needs to have some reassurance that they understand the sector because you know media uh, development uh, and certainly programmatic impact are uh, very specific uh, art forms and uh, you need to be working with a partner that can generate the kind of feedback you need. Um, so there's a question around uh, whether it helps to involve the evaluator in proposal writing uh, to specify the indicators from the evaluator's point of view. I mean, this doesn't tend to happen because uh, in many projects, evaluators are selected by the donor uh, and uh, come up the project from the outside and use the indicators that you have specified in order to assess to what extent your project is on target uh, and has, has met those goals. Um, I've seen project proposals where there's one of the partners has an evaluation role uh, which I think is difficult because it's uh, a lot to ask for uh, a partner to give a, a completely objective uh, opinion of a project which they're involved in uh, and therefore which has reputational issues for them. Um, I think that indicators and indeed all logical frameworks are uh, issues that should be reviewed on a regular basis as a project is implemented. So um, I don't think agencies should be afraid of going back to donors and saying the assumptions we made at the beginning have been disproved by uh, the project's activities or by uh, intelligence or information that we have gathered during the implementation phase. So I think there's always room for uh, revisiting um, the targets uh, and the, therefore the indicators and, and, and going to a donor and saying, look, you know, when we develop the, pro the, the project, 
this was the situation. Uh, the situation has changed and it, that, it might have changed on a number of levels. It might have changed within the context of uh, the project itself, but it might have changed uh, through um, the wider operating environment. So as long as one can demonstrate a solid rationale for any modifications to project design, most donors will be on your side. They want the project to succeed. Uh, therefore, they will want you to set yourself goals and indeed indicators that are achievable. So my message there is never be afraid of going back to a donor and renegotiating. Um, obviously, they're going to have a problem with you trying to totally rewrite the, the, the project design, but uh, modifying uh, the goals, uh, sorry, the indicators and results in order to make them realistic uh, and justifying that with solid feedback from your beneficiaries. Uh, this is something that uh, I think isn't done enough and should be done more often. I think there's a question around um, the regularity of monitoring in order to, um, uh, to assess the extent to which indicators are being met. It's, again, depend, will depend hugely on the project. Um, most programs will have a mandatory six month kind of interim report cycle, but some will obviously require reports to be um, uh, filed very much more often. Uh, I think that to have realistic um, and credible data about uh, the extent to which indicators are being met uh, it's unrealistic to look at a, a period much less than six months because, as I said right at the beginning, I think media development projects are a slow burn. Uh, and it's also a question of kind of morale and motivation within a consortium. I think you don't want to be painting a picture of, um, uh, not of failure, but of... Um, uh, slow delivery or slow achievement you know the uh, uh, if you're constantly trying to assess to what extent you've reached um, um, targets uh, your increments will be small better to inspire people by having uh, a a decent size increment if you like uh, and, and and sharing that and showing forward movement uh, throughout the project life cycle Uh, I'm aware that we're uh, probably running out of time, but um, I just wanted to say, make a few remarks about sustainability because, again, it's become such an important issue for for donors, and, a, and an issue I think in which donors are tend to or tend to be hugely uh, unrealistic. The examples I've listed there are kind of typical arguments in favour of the sustainability of a project. So it's about uh, putting resources uh, and systems in place uh, which can um, achieve um, a longer term resonance for the project. Uh, so investment in curricular resources, these are all very clear. Uh, these are, the, these are uh, outputs that remain after the project uh, has ended uh, and can be physical evidence of its achievements. Uh, I think there are more abstract uh, forms of sustainability as well, and I've listed two there, one of which is um, creating a community of best practice. So uh, promoting uh, effective ways of working within a certain uh, environment uh, and encouraging multiple stakeholders to buy into those ideas. I think within the context of, uh, of institutions, it's very possible to create a learning culture to uh, introduce the idea of training and development uh, and professional improvement as being uh, part of the daily life of an organization. Uh, as we know, so often um, media outlets don't invest enough in, in, in training their staff, uh, but creating an expectation from staff that they should have training and uh, achieving a commitment from management to offer training or offer development opportunities. These are important and play a huge role in the sustainability of a project. 
Um, the I mention that. Oh, yeah, I am. Um, I managed uh, a project in uh, in Yekaterinburg in Russia for a couple of years uh, in uh, the early 2000s, uh, and it was a project that had been funded by DFID for for six years. Uh, it was a training centre for broadcast journalists, and after six years of funding, suddenly everyone concerned w woke up to the fact that there needed to, needed to be a sustainability plan. So my job was to try and introduce sustainability after six years. The big problem with that is that sustainability needs to be, needs to be built in from the outset. Uh, it needs to be a, a core component of project design and delivery. Uh, and it's not something that you can uh, introduce uh, when ideas and expectations and approaches are all already well established so in the example of the training school in russia it was extremely difficult to turn around to media outlets and ask them to start paying for a service that they had been receiving for free uh, had that idea been introduced early on and perhaps had uh, payment for training being um, introduced uh, in, 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 according to an incremental um, system, then their level of buy-in and indeed their expectations would have been completely different. Um, there's a question here about uh, the, uh, different organizations from various fields submitting proposals rather than a single entity like a consortium. Um, I mean, if I've understood this correctly, it's about, um, is this about uh, organizations that are, that are outside the kind of media field? Or is it about um, uh, multiple um, partners collaborating on a proposal uh, in order to uh, achieve multiple goals? If you, if you could answer that. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, more and more, I think it's become essential to look for partners outside of the traditional you know, media family. Donors so often are looking for projects that address thematic goals rather than strictly professional goals. So they're looking for um, organizations to deliver projects that um, change public opinion on issues like gender or youth. Uh, human rights and so on and so forth. In such projects, it's difficult to find and source the expertise entirely within the media sector. Uh, drawing in expertise from civil society, even from government, becomes uh, imperative uh, and a priority. So I think that the more projects can present those opportunities for kind of multiple stakeholders to collaborate on producing and designing uh, holistic projects the better uh, and uh, certainly some of the more successful projects that i've been involved in have gone beyond the media sector uh, in order to draw in that expertise and i think it's arguable that donor funding is one of the few opportunities that um, professional media will get for that kind of engagement because it's not necessarily something they're going to do within the course uh, of their routine professional activities. Very briefly on risks and mitigation because I'm sure this is a section that's familiar to you and um, this is where local partners if you like really come to their own because they're able to identify what the risks are on the ground uh, and the best ways of addressing them. When I'm writing proposals, I divide risks into five uh, separate types, uh, political, programmatic, economic, organizational, and security related. Uh, and I think that's an expectation from many donors that those areas should be covered. The most important aspect for me of uh, a risk matrix is demonstrating that the project is viable and realistic, but also that it has some kind of a plan B, that there are contingency plans uh, and that they are fit for purpose. So always think about contingency plans when producing a risk matrix. Uh, 
I will uh, circulate this presentation um, afterwards, so you'll be able to look through the uh, issues uh, covered in this slide. Um, key personnel are often required in proposals, CVs, uh, at the very least, uh, a breakdown of the different roles that uh, will be um, implicit to the uh, to, to the project management. Uh, there's a caveat, I think, around around CVs that uh, if you are presenting CVs, make sure that they are fit for purpose and that they do highlight the skills that are relevant to the project. Um, and there have been many cases in which uh, donors have asked to test the skills of key personnel within projects and have then discovered that the individuals concerned don't speak the languages they said they did or haven't worked in the places they claim to have. So if it's possible to check skills, uh, then one should do so. Um, when you're looking at project management teams, uh, more and more donors will be looking for balance within the team, a good balance between men and women, uh, a good balance of skills uh, and a realistic provision. And I can appreciate that many agencies are nervous about overloading projects with uh, too many managers, um, but it's definitely a mistake to go in the opposite direction. Uh, you should make allowance for the individuals who will genuinely be managing uh, the project uh, and you should put in enough money to ensure that their time is covered and you shouldn't be nervous about that because the projects uh, of this kind do have a significant management overhead uh, and there's nothing more soul destroying than managing a project knowing that you're delivering it at a loss. On the issue of presentation, I think these things speak for themselves. Um, again, I mentioned in the beginning, think about the evaluator. Uh, so often in order to meet uh, the requirements of page lengths uh, or word lengths, um, word counts rather, uh, proposal writers will cram huge screeds of text at a very small font, uh, uh, narrow margins, um, with uh, no paragraph breaks, uh, and these proposals are a nightmare to read. Uh, it's, uh, m my, my motto is that there is no sentence that can't be uh, reduced in length. You know, this uh, proposal should be about um, presenting ideas um, succinctly and concisely, uh, and you're, the, the way you present them will do that. Uh, to a large extent, I will certainly um, underline that. This is the final slide. I probably, I know I run on, I apologize for that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, flag up a number of issues which I think are essential to managing um, the process of putting a proposal together. And uh, starting from the top, I think absolutely you should first and foremost write two paragraphs that um, that sum up the project, that sell the project, like an elevator pitch. And you should use those to uh, explain your idea to partners, contributors, colleagues, everybody. I think that's the, that, that's the main starting point. Um, bring together uh, partners who have something to bring to the table, obviously, uh, but don't bring too, so many partners together that you'll then find the project impossible to manage. Uh, and when you do form a consortium, uh, establish the ground rules, make it very clear from the word go what their expectations can be, both professionally and financially. Usually then, uh, as a starting point, I will draw up a, a timetable of tasks and I'll delegate some of those tasks to other people because, as I said right at the beginning, delivering, producing and writing a proposal single-handedly is a very tough job. Uh, if you have the opportunity to ask questions of the donor at any stage, then do that because uh, often terms of reference are not as clear as, or, or indeed as, in, uh, as insightful as they should be. Um, always write the log frame first because the log frame is uh, the glue that holds the project together. And if you write that first and agree it, then you'll be absolutely clear about what you're doing and it'll make 
it much easier to write all the other sections. When I've written the log frame, I then quantify the activities because only then will I know what one can afford to do. So um, work out uh, how many, uh, what the, the scope and reach of the project is going to be uh, and agree that with your partners. If you agree that too late in the day, you'll just end up rewriting your proposal because you'll end up taking away activities or modifying them and that's a big, big mistake. So work out the activities, get the partners to agree to them, get the partners to sign off on them uh, and then you'll be uh, at a very, in a very good position. Um, I always go outside, you know, the, uh, the circle of immediate contacts to ask experts for advice about specific aspects of activity design and delivery um, and, uh, and to test assumptions that either I've made or the donors made. So uh, involve experts all the way through. And finally, balance writing time and negotiation time. Make sure you've got enough time to write, actually put the words on the paper, but don't limit the time that you allow yourself for agreeing project design, budgets and everything else with your partners and with your colleagues. Uh, so these are uh, the steps that I go through in order to um, uh, get a proposal from A to Z. So thank you very much indeed uh, for your patience uh, and uh, for your questions uh, and your engagement. Uh, I sadly I won't be able to throw the uh, session open to, to questions from the group, but um, do feel free to, uh, to, to, to keep in touch. Uh, and um, I would, I do very much look forward to the opportunity to deliver uh, similar types of training um, and uh, insight in the future. Thank you very much.